after me. I'm a man. I'm 40. Hey, what's up, everybody? I'm Nick DiMartino. That's Liam Barwick. Uh, we are back for another episode of Moving the Goalposts. Uh, uh, we got a lot to get to, but, you know, of course, I first have to do all this, uh, all the plugs and everything. Uh, YouTube.com slash ETB Network, where you can find all the Empty the Bench Network shows. And you can find all our podcasts at etbpodcast.com. And you can listen to Moving the Goalposts wherever you get your podcasts. And make sure to like and subscribe. And, of course, we are presented by Playback. Watching sports is more fun with others, but we spend too much time watching alone. Uh, Playback is a virtual space where communities can stream live sports together with everyone perfectly synced up. Creators can hop on stage, deliver their own play-by-play analysis and commentary, and invite viewers up for Q&A. Playback makes watching sports fully interactive and a social experience. From playing fantasy sports, repping your favorite players and teams, and watching with the commentators and communities you care about. Win or lose, sports are best enjoyed together. Join our community by going to playback.tv slash ETV network to find out more, including our live stream schedule. Okay, so, uh, of course, there's a lot to get to. Uh, Knicks lose Game 7 to the Pacers in uh, what I would call a very uh, devastating sort of, I wouldn't say, I wouldn't say devastating. Uh, it, it, it was a, it was a weird thing. It, it was a weird thing because it was the first time I felt that's the psychology of Nick fans was different than it usually is. And, and I think, you know what I'm talking about? Um, Nick fans are disproportionately, it seems like dissatisfied with the team. Uh, they're known for booing their draft picks. Uh, we hated it. We, we frequently are unhappy about a lot of things, sometimes rightfully so. Uh, and I, I think part of it is just that we're, Nick fans are often used to teams that are that don't put in effort or don't tr- or you know or we feel uh, have big egos and you know they, they 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 aren't like a gritty team usually the teams that we've seen and th- this team is just sort of different. This team reminds a lot of people of the '90s Knicks. And I did say at one point, I think it was on the show a few weeks ago, and I said, look, it's great that we won the first two games, but I think in a long series, the Pacers probably have the advantage because the Knicks are just too banged up. And the the Knicks ended up getting more banged up. Like, like they were more banged up than we thought. It turns out Brunson had some type of – it needed surgery on his left hand. And we can get into that in a little bit. I don't know what it was with his left hand. And it's a shooting hand, too. You'd think it would have affected him a lot more, it seems like. We, we didn't even know he had an injury until Sunday in Game 7. It was just a bizarre sort of thing. I don't know if the Knicks are hiding anything. or it, it like it, it's, it was just weird that he needed – it was to the point where he needed surgery. Um, but I don't know. It's, it's the only time that I've seen Knicks fans sort of like – Knicks fans were sort of – accepting of the fact that we lost and were proud of the team. It was the first time I've really ever seen that. Um, From my experience as a sports fan, usually that's not how it goes. Usually it's more along the lines of we should have been better or, and, you know, fire everybody. And this is a disgrace Uh, like the Mets in October of 2022, when they lost to the Padres, Met fans did not have that attitude. Nick fans. I, I think that Nick fans, Really had the we didn't expect to be as good as we were, and because of that, Nick fans were able to accept that, and also the fact that it's not we lost, but we lost going out swinging. You know, like we lost, 
with all of our best players on stretchers. And I'm not saying that that's a good thing, but I, I'm under the impression that fans would rather see that than lose because we didn't rebound or something like that, or because your best player couldn't shoot a three. Like it, to me, it, it just seemed like seemed like the psychology of Nick fans was a little different than what what we're used to seeing. Am I wrong about that? No, but I, I don't think it had anything to do with that they didn't expect to be good. I just think they had so much injuries in the end. Well, I think it was a few things. First of all, it was easier to lose a game. It's easier to accept, I guess, a loss in game seven when you they, the game was over at the end of the first quarter. I mean, they cut it down to six, but did anyone actually think they were going to make any sort of comeback when they cut it down to six? No. So they, they lost the game early, and – I think that th- this Nick team went as far as they could go in terms of with their health situation. I mean, also, I, I well, I, yeah, Brunson was right. I don't want to hear that as an excuse for game seven because Brunson left the game with the game already in hand for Indiana. But, um, yeah, I, I just think they were so injured, um, which is 100% their, their own fault in terms of, one of the reasons they're so injured is because of the just ridiculous overplay of the coat of Tom Thibodeau of how he overplays the players and stuff like that. But they were so injured. I mean, there was no Mitchell Robinson. There was no Julius Randall. There was no Bogdanovich. There was no OG Ananobi. In reality, there was no OG Ananobi. And in reality, there was not really a Josh Hart and five guys being injured. This is not the NFL. So five guys being injured uh, would be equivalent to a, you know double digit amount of players being injured in the NFL. So it's that was just I think too much to overcome. And like you said, I did you know I think they gave a lot of uh, you know they gave a lot of um, good memories on the season. I can't stand and I hate when fans clap a team after a a playoff loss and, you know, that ends their season. That's one of my pet peeves. I hate that. I think there's only one goal. And and if you fail, if you don't get it and the Knicks did fail, they didn't win the championship. And one of the reasons they didn't win the championship or they didn't progress any more than last year was because they were horribly, horribly injured. Yeah. And I I think that, Well, the point is, is that I I think that Nick fans, it's a lot easier to accept that, to accept that as a, I think it's easier to accept it when you know the team is heavily injured. And even if we did go to the next round, we wouldn't have had much of a chance against the Celtics, even though I'd rather win. uh, I'd rather win and not have, and get swept by the Celtics. it's, It's always better to go to the next round to get swept than it is to not even make the next round. Um, that, that's how, always how I've thought of it. Um, I, I think that's true. I, I mean, obviously, the fact that the team was so injured is obviously played a role in how the fans viewed it. I, I mean, it's just like Nick fans are, you know, if, it, it would be one thing if we were a fully healthy team. And even if we were a fully healthy team, it's like we probably, like, we wouldn't be expected to beat the Celtics or anything like that. We weren't like we're, the Knicks are not in a position where they're like, we have to win now. I don't think the the Knicks are, uh, it, uh, the Knicks are not like, you know, in a win now mode or anything like that. They're more a team that is building in a sense uh, for lack of mm. a better term. I don't know if building is the right way to put it, but like they're, they're not like a, a, a team. Uh, they're not like the Celtics this year where it's like, the Cel- if the Celtics don't win the championship this year, there's going to be a right. lot of questions and it, it's going to be a problem. Whereas with the Knicks, it's not a huge deal, especially with their health situation. Um, I mean, it, it, you're right. We didn't really have much of a chance in after the first quarter, it, it, at, or at least at the end of the first half. And, and it wasn't so much the score that would tell me that. It's just the trajectory of the game and the fact that the Knicks really had no way of coming back. Um, so well, Brunson, they couldn't snap a nosebleed either, but yeah. Right, that too. Uh, yeah, right, it's not just the score. I mean, a 20-point lead, like they say no lead is safe in the NBA. I think that's BS. I think the Pacers lead against the Knicks, the whole game was safe. Oh, uh, no, I don't think so. It did go to six. I mean, I, don't, well, I, I still didn't think the Knicks were going to come back, but it did go to six. Point, point. Though. It, it felt safe the whole game, at least in my view. I thought it felt safe. No, I don't. I, I I agree that no lead is safe in the NBA at all. I, I 
it's crazy how quick runs happen in the NBA now. But yeah, I, I mean, they had a bad health situation. And frankly, they, I don't think they were really, I don't know how to say this. They, I think they, they didn't, they shouldn't have really beat Philadelphia even, to be honest with you. I think they, well, they got a couple of late wins. Well, I, I just think they weren't as, 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 as good a team in that series as it may have, as people may have thought. I thought Philadelphia didn't were inches away from, you know, were margins away from winning that series. The Knicks, you know, never looked like I was never confident the Knicks were going to win that series. Um, I, I just think they're they They weren't like terrific in that series against the seven seed who was banged up. So I didn't come in to this, series feeling you know any confidence like we talked about and even like we said up up 2-0 it didn't really mean anything and even winning by 30 I think didn't really mean anything so yeah, yeah they were they were just they were just way too injured in the end I think if they were healthy they would have won the series but Definitely. um but uh yeah they were just way too banged up and I I, I think also though you know they would have I think also Nick fans are mo- some of the most knowledgeable in the league. So I think that anybody with any knowledge would understand that Boston would have beat them like a drum in the next series. So I think that also adds to what you're talking about. Yeah. Uh, I, I think that, I, I think that certainly does add to it, but you know, I, may, maybe it would have been different if we had lost like on a, like in a, a close game, as opposed to like, it, we were sort of let down gently a little bit when we just sort of accepted the fact that we, we weren't going to win. That's, I think that's kind of how Nick fans uh, sort of viewed it in a sense. Um, now the thing with Jalen Brunson's hand, this is such a, this seems so bizarre. To, apparently. So apparently he got surgery. He needed surgery on his left hand. Uh it was successful surgery he got. Uh, it, I don't know. Did you know anything about this beforehand? Because before Sunday, we didn't know about Jalen Brunson having an having a thumb injury or anything like that, right? No, I knew he was injured. But a, a th- something with his hand? No, but you could tell he was injured the way he was playing. Yeah, but but it didn't seem like it was anything. It, it didn't seem like he had a broken left hand. Uh, and apparently it was a play that I saw, and it was uh, – I forget which, which player it was, but he was playing defense, and it was like a slap. And it apparently that was the play that did it. There, there's no mm-hmm. way that alone could have broken his hand. He, it ha- he had to have been injured all along, uh, at least a little bit. Uh, I, I, don't, I can't imagine his hand would have been totally fine. I thought it, he had a problem with his foot, it, it seemed like. Um, if if anything, yeah, he definitely had a problem with his foot. But I didn't know of anything uh, with, with his hand. Um, it, you know, it, it's just the, the thing is, is that with the Knicks this year, with, with in that series, um, in that series, the Knicks would have been much better. The, the Knicks would have had an advantage if they were able to win. In, in order to win that series, I feel like the Knicks had to win right away. Uh, they had to win. It, it, they couldn't let it go too long. They couldn't let it go seven games. And after game six, I felt it a little bit. I felt I don't know how well this is, how much this is going to work out. Um, it because the team was just too injured to really. It, it, and, and the Pacers are a much more finesse team than the Knicks are. They're not gritty like they are. And I just thought it was obvious to me that in a long that the longer the series goes, the bigger problems the Knicks were going to have. Yeah. I mean, yeah, of course they, they just, they, they, it was, I mean, yeah, it was a bad health situation. I think they took it as, took it as far as they could go. And that's, I mean, I don't think that there's really honestly, you know, as, as, as boring as it is, I just don't think there's really much analysis that you can put into what happened to the Knicks, because I think it's just, literally simple as they were too injured and that's it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I don't, but you know, it's also, you know, there's some contracts coming up and we don't know. I, I mean, I, I don't, I'm not saying I'm, I'm doubtful or, or I'm not, not trying to be doom and gloom or anything, but I don't know. I don't know if they're going to keep everybody. Uh, 
Isaiah Hartenstein's contract is uh, up after this year, I think, or, or this year it's up. Yeah, this this it's a, it's up already. It's up already. Um, do you think they're going to re-sign him? Uh, as uh, uh, I, I think it depends what the number is. Uh, yeah. I would say no. I don't think they. I would say no. Right. I think the number is just going to be too high. And I th- well, I, I think a team will just sign him for a higher number, yeah, than they think. And the next, and it's just not going to be worth it. And I, I like Hartenstein. I think he's improved tremendously. Uh, and it, but it, it's just like I don't think it's going to be worth it. Uh, it's just not. It's kind of like you know, every, Nick fans love Jeremy Lin and everything, but it just wouldn't have been worth the money to spend on him for the Knicks. It's a, it's a, it's the same thing. It just it just isn't going to be worth it. Uh, yeah, he, Hartenstein. He got into a lot of foul trouble early on. Uh, which wasn't great. Um, you know, Thibodeau, I think that Thibodeau is one of those coaches who he gets the most out of his players. Um, he really gets the most out of his, I think he really gets the most out of his current, out of his situation. Uh, I mean, you, you look at the improvement of guys of like role players, like, uh, DiVincenzo, Hartenstein, uh, it, it, like, I, I think Thibodeau does deserve a lot of credit, uh, for the Knicks success. I, I think that Thibodeau, just like any other head coach, especially genius head coaches like him, has a lot of pros and cons to his coaching. There's certainly a lot of uh drawbacks. There's certainly a lot a, a lot of really great benefits and drawbacks to it. Uh mm-hmm. I think he does overplay his starters. Uh I don't know how much that has to do with the injuries. It probably has a, it, it, in my view it's probably somewhere in the middle. It might have something to do with it. Um but even if not for the injuries, I, I don't really – like, it was weird to me how Miles McBride could start, but also in some games didn't play. And he really – I think Mc, guys like McBride and Burks really could have been good pieces uh, to be used throughout the year. I, I mean, like, I don't know. It, 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 like, so, I, I did have some issues with that. But overall, I think Thibodeau is the best head coach the Knicks have seen in our lifetimes probably. Yeah, but uh, I don't know. That first of all, that's not a, that's not a high bar. But um, I know, I'm just saying. No, I, I I don't think that you could. I think you're you'd be naive to think that it doesn't it doesn't have anything to do with him. The injuries. I'm I'm not saying it doesn't. I mean, I'm saying I don't know how much it does. Like I, I don't know. Down. I I think that I think that it probably does have something to do with the injuries. I said I don't know to what degree it has to do with the injuries. I mean, do you think Bogdanovich's injury is due to being overplayed? I mean, he only played like nine. No, he got hit in the knee. Right. So I think, he, I think Hart's is. I think yeah. Anunoby's is. Anunoby's I think, certainly I, I think is. Anunoby, yes. Uh, I think Anunoby's is. is. Yeah. Yeah. Possibly. Yeah. Uh, uh, I mean, some of them I, I think seem like they could be. Or do you think Robinson? Yeah. yeah. Or do you think Robinson's just injury prone? I think both. I think okay. I think it's a little bit of both too. Um, I, I think that it. Yeah, I think that really could be an issue, and he's had this issue a lot uh, in the past with his playoff with his teams. Um, Thibodeau, uh, even though I really do think he's a very good head coach, but and. and you know, he has a lot of great experience. He just is – he hasn't really just gotten over the hump yet. Yeah. Well, he, he hasn't gotten the hump, which might be because of him. Yeah, maybe a little – yeah. But I don't know. I mean, it, coaching is one of those things where it just takes years to perfect. Uh, it, it just – I don't know. It, like, he, he hasn't really had a, a, a good enough star player to really win championships with. Right. Uh, he hasn't. Re- I guess that could be. A uh, that's not true. Like who? Who? Eric Rose. Come on. What do you Derek mean, come Rose? On. He was the MVP. He okay. He was good for a couple of years, but he wasn't good. And those were the years that he was coaching him. Yeah. Well, for some of those, yes, but not. And all then the- what happened? And then what happened? But what happened when he stopped being good? Why did he when stop he- being good? He got injured. Exactly. Oh, you think it's Thibodeau's fault that Derrick yes. Rose had knee problems? He Completely. had knee problems all along. He always had knee problems. You can't blame that on Thibodeau. Come on. Was, was Derrick Rose? It is true that he that that Thibodeau does tend to overplay his starters. I don't see any evidence at all that the reason Derrick Rose had problems with his knee was because of Tom Thibodeau. I don't think that's exactly accurate. 
As so you, don't, you don't think there's any problem, any pattern of all these guys getting injured? No, no, I do. I do think there is a pattern. What I'm saying is I don't think it necessarily applies to Derrick Rose in particular. That's what I'm saying. Uh, no, I, I don't think – do you think – look, I'm, I'm not the biggest Derrick Rose fan. Um, I, I always felt he was a little overrated. Um, although he, he wasn't terrible with, he had a few stints with the Knicks. Um, I don't know. It, it, like Leon Rose, I think it, we were talking about Thibodeau all this time. I think Leon Rose deserves a lot of credit too. Uh, Leon Rose, basically he, he went from an agent to a GM and just, uh, signed a bunch of his guys <laughs> that he knew. Uh, I, I, I don't like that he's often unavailable to the media, uh, but you know I'm. I think I'm a bit of a Leon Rose fan now. Uh, yeah, I, I don't. I mean, yeah, he did. He did a good job putting the team together. Yeah. Um, but let's see what he does in the in the off season. Yeah, yeah, I, I think that could be in it. it yeah, obviously. Um, all right. So the Pacers, they. Uh, you, I'm sure you saw this game or at least parts of it. The Pacers blew it against the Celtics going to the next round or already moving, <laughs> playing, uh, you know, already in the second, uh, already, uh, in the East, in the Eastern conference finals, the Pacers blow it against the Celtics. The Celtics are a weird team to me. They're like, they're, they're a very, they're a stacked roster. I think that their record is a little bit inflated because they play in such a week. They play in a weak conference the weaker of the two conferences. Uh, and Al Horford shot like 12 threes. Tatum is often situationally bad in certain games. And they're oddly bad at home, it seems like. Uh, they have a lot of bad playoff games at home. Um, I think the Celtics have been pretty dominant in these playoffs. But this, the Pacers, uh, normally a team that's been um, – Waiting, but it's been played just played seven games and then is playing a team that you know played a quick series before that. Uh, normally, that team that played seven games will do better in the first game than they do in the rest of the series because you just played and the other team's resting. But then, you know, like Mark Messier said, a team is he's never lost a series because of too much rest so. The team that's more rested will probably win in the end. But so the Pacers blew the one game that they had a shot to win. Um, and I think now it's 2-0. Two, two so the Celtics were much more dominant tonight. But in that first game, I don't understand, first of all, why they were even trying to get the ball to Siakam in the first place. Um, they were in a situation where they needed to make free throws. And then also Siakam... I understand, okay, he doesn't want to foul him or whatever, but he just didn't contest Jalen Brown's shot at all. Yeah. He just ran towards him and then didn't put his hand up, anything like that. Um, you knew the Celtics were going to win once it got to overtime. But, yeah, the, if the Pacers were going to put any pressure the Celtics' way, it was that first game. Celtics much, 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 much more dominant tonight. Yeah. Um. So I, I think that this is going to be a, a quick one. Yeah, you think it could be quick. We don't know. I mean, look, the Pacers have really – the Pacers are playing with house money. And I, I said the same thing about the Knicks if they had beaten the Pacers. And frankly, they were playing with house money even against the Pacers given their whole injury situation. Mm -hmm. The Pacers this series are playing with house money. It's like it's not – the Pacers are going to be remembered this year as the team that really punched above their weight, similar to how the Knicks in a way punched above their weight. Mm -hmm. Um, but the Pacers even more so they were a six seed, um, uh, which is to be honest, not a particularly uncommon thing, especially in the East. Like you do occasionally see teams in the East that really are, that are okay, but they're, that, but you don't necessarily expect them to go on a big run and they can, you know, uh, make it to the Eastern conference finals. And then you kind of forget about them. Uh, it, it, that's usually kind of how it works sometimes. Uh, and the Pacers, like I said, it, it, they, they, there's not a lot of pressure on them. All of the pressure this series, I think, is on the Celtics. Um, and, I mean, there's going to be a little more pressure on the Pacers now now that they're going to be playing at home. 
Uh, even if it's a six game series, I don't think every six game series is always close. Um, it, you never, I mean, there are times when six game series, a game, a series goes six games, but it feels, uh, less it, it, like, it seems like it's, it, it's a bigger blowout than the, than the score, than the series would predict, would, uh, suggest, um, uh, but all of the pressure in this series is on the Celtics, Jalen Brown, Tatum, uh, like it's very much, they have to at least make the finals, if not win the finals. Otherwise, it, there's going to be a lot of like, I don't know, question or a, a lot of questions that need to be answered in the off season. So Celtic, the Celtics, they they really just have the most pressure. Like the thing is, the the Celtics are a very good team. I'm not denying that they're a very good team. Uh, it's also true that they're playing against weaker competition than the dominant teams in the West, by f- without question. Um, now, I'm not one to say the com- – like, look, I'm not going to harp on that. I'm just saying I think it might inflate them a little bit. Uh, and the Pacers are not that good. They're a good team. They're a good offensive team. They're a good shooting team. They don't play a lot of defense, let's face it. Their defense is not very good. And it – it's like they're just not on the same level as the competition that they'd be facing if they were in the West. Um, so I, I just have a lot of doubts about them, uh, about the Celtics. Do, are, are you one of those people who says that, like, you root against the team that beat your team? No, I don't care. But um, I, I, I just I, – I, I, I root against the Celtics, I guess. But yeah. No, I don't care who, who beats my team. But uh, I mean, I guess it would be – honestly, be – be better if the team that beat you wins the championship. Yeah, because you can see um, you lost to the champions. Right. But I, I, I think all of that is kind of what you said is true, but it's it, it kind of becomes more of a moot point because the Celtics were completely dominant tonight, and I think they've looked like the better team most of the time. I mean, even that game that the Pacers blew, the Celtics led for most of the game. So, I mean, I, I, I think that that's maybe true, but – I just think that the Celtics are the better team. And let's not forget Indiana is still the sixth seed and the Celtics were the best team in the NBA this year. So I, I think that, yes, okay, there's pressure on the Celtics, but, you know, uh, pressure makes diamonds as well. So it yeah. doesn't really mean that the Celtics are in the worst position, of course. No, I mean, well, if anything, they're in the best position because it, it – I mean, we're much, there's a much bigger talent gap between the Pacers and Celtics than between the Timberwolves and Mavericks. Uh, I mean, the the like like I would bet that if you were to look at the odds on DraftKings or any of the betting apps, the Celtics would have a much higher chance of at, would have much better odds at winning the championship than uh, than than the Timberwolves or Mavericks, uh, mainly because this uh, mainly because this series is you know much easier for them. Uh, you know, it's, you know, they're in the weaker conference, but look, I mean, I'm not, you, I'm not trying to hold that against them. Uh, you play your competition and that's that. I mean, there's nothing more you could really ask for. Uh, they might end up sweeping this series and we totally forget about them playing uh, game one. Uh, I don't know. Like that Which could happen. They won, by the way. Which they won. You're right. Nice. But they didn't play, but you know, they, yeah, but if, but if 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 the if the if the if the worst part is that you won but you didn't play well and that's your biggest drawback, then you're in a really good position. I agree completely. I agree completely, and it, it could be the case. And by the way, I, I think you make a good point. I mean, there are times when uh, it, we see this in college football a lot, right? Like we see it in college football a lot when a team doesn't play well and you just and they get a like. What one time Georgia during one of their uh, repeat years uh, when they won winning the national championship, one of in uh, they beat Missouri by like only seventeen points or something like that, and people like the media they were just crushing Georgia. They're like Georgia, what are you doing? You guys stunk. And it's like, what standard are they being held to? Do they have to win every game fifty eight nothing or something like? Like some, like you see that a lot in college football, and it just is, it's never really made a whole lot of sense to me. Um, you're right. I'm not saying the Celtics are in a bad position. I just, I don't know. They, they seem like kind of a weird, all I'm saying is they seem like a little bit of a weird team. And like, it, like of course, all of these teams are in good positions, just objectively speaking. Anybody in the, in the, in their conference finals 
mm-hmm. is objectively in a good position, obviously. Um, I think yeah. that the, I think that the interesting thing is that we're going to be getting, I think for, I saw this meme, I think it was for like, for like the sixth consecutive year, we're going to be getting uh, a, a different, we're not going to be getting any repeats of NBA uh, champion uh, of NBA champions. It seems like uh, there's it, like, like one of the biggest criticisms of the NBA for a really long time was conference champions. No, no, no. Like NBA finals champions. Wait, what was it? We're, no, what I'm saying is we're not getting any repeats. For what? Of NBA Finals champions. For the longest stretch, you mean? Right, right. Yeah. For like, I think it was six years or something. Uh, I, it's like 2019, I think it was. Uh, and, you know, one of the biggest criticisms, which I think is, you know, one of the biggest criticisms of the NBA has been, oh, you already know who's going to win. It's only the same two or three teams. It's like, I, I think that really, I, I think that now it really doesn't seem like that anymore. Like it, it's really, I think in the NBA now it's, uh, it, there's a lot more parity and there's a lot more, I, I think that there's, uh, I don't think that really applies so much anymore. I feel like there's a lot more teams who have a chance and can go on a run than there were before. Yeah. Yeah. I, uh, I but I, I just think that the Celtics are, I mean, I mean, they, they, they lost like both the series is they lost one game. Yeah. Uh, and then, like you said, same sort of thing with that Georgia thing. Um, but uh, you know, they they the media was like oh they're in trouble and then they just completely dominated the next three games in both series so yeah and, and by the way it could be true that they end up dominating the pacers in uh the, the you know on the road the next two games I, I don't know i mean and by the way this whole thing might be completely like it, it, the whole thing might seem silly if they end up doing that so i don't know it, it, we don't know how it's going to work um uh, you know they are they are heavy favorites to they are favorite they are still heavy favorites um but you know it, there's going to be a lot of pressure and all that uh i, I do want to talk about the scotty scheffler thing a little bit the scotty uh so the the scotty scheffler so this new so last week last friday uh news came out that he was arrested on the way to the uh on the way to on, on the way to the uh, masters no, PGA Championship. I'm sorry. PGA, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. The PGA Championship. Yeah. And he was arrested and charged with like assault. Uh, and yes. though it, basically, wait, wait, what happened exactly? So a guy died on the road. Somebody died yeah, on so, the road. Okay. So the PGA Championship is the second major of the year. Um, so, yeah. So Thursday is. Um, Thursday is the first day of the tournament. So Thursday they played. Friday night or early morning or whatever it was, someone died on the road. So they had stopped traffic in that area. They Scheffler was trying to get around by saying, right, whether he was saying I have to get to the course or whatever. And then the police officer told him to stop. He said that, Scheffler said that he didn't hear the police officer tell him to stop the, and he, and he thought he was waving him through. So he went through the officer said that he grabbed onto the car. Why someone would grab onto a moving, moving vehicle is beyond me. Um, and that he Scheffler hit um, the officer and dragged him with his car. Now a video came out today that, shows that maybe he hit him very slightly and he certainly didn't drag him. Um, and uh, he's being charged with a bunch of four different counts. One of them is second degree assault on an officer, which is a felony, but I, I don't know about this one. Um, the police officer already is being either written up or suspended for a rules violation because he didn't put his uh, body camera on. His body camera was off. Um, he was also uh, re- remanded for doing uh, 
donuts in a parking lot with a drunk civilian one time. Uh, this Wait, officer. Is it, I saw that he doing donuts in a parking lot. What does that mean? You don't know what doing donuts is? No. Doing donuts is like when you speed the car really fast around and it makes like those skid marks all over. And oh, I've, I've never heard circular. of that. I, I, thought it meant, I thought it had something to do with like eating donuts. No. <laughs> you speed the car really, really fast around in a circle and then it makes the skid marks go all over the into a circle. Okay. Sure, you've seen it on TV or something. I'm um, sure I have. So, yeah, uh, he was already remanded for doing donuts with a drunk civilian during while well, on shift. Um, so, I, I, I don't know really how how much we can trust this guy, uh, but I mean, you know, if Novak Djokovic was arrested is arrested in uh, June, you know, next week during the French Open. Um, that's essentially what the equivalent of this is because Scheffler is the best golfer in the world. He's been extremely dominant recently, like extremely dominant. Um, and he was arrested in the middle of a in the middle of a major tournament, one of the four major tournaments, and. He actually, he was somehow he was released in time to play on Friday, and he actually had not a bad day on Friday. Um, he didn't win the tournament in the end, but um, yeah, it was it was one of the more you know shocking stories for the number one golfer in the world to be arrested during a major. Yeah, I don't think we've ever seen that before, and it was like the best golfer in the world. I, I, do you think did the police officer like know who he was? That I don't know. And did he pull the "Do you know who I am?" card? I mean, I don't know if he did or not. Uh, but like the well, thing is, he, did, he said that he was he said that he was golfing for the um, that he was a golfer for the PGA tournament. I but I don't, in that case, I don't know if that's a "Do you know who I am?" or if that's a telling them why he's. You know, right, would need to get through or whatever. Because if you've ever been pulled over, the cop, from my experience, the cop always says, you know, where are you going? Right. And ask, they usually ask for some type of background, some type of that background story. And that's probably what they asked him. Uh, you know, it is weird to me that this, pol I mean, this police officer. Well, I don't think they asked him anything. I think that he was told that it was just like a, a accident. And then the officer was standing there and telling him to stop. And he thought he was waving him through. Right. And that doesn't – like to me, that that just sounds like a misunderstanding. Look, look I right. was not there. I don't know the full story. But it sounds like this police officer just totally overreacted. Like it, 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 like how long – like if he thinks he's waving him in, like apparently like, was one cop waving him in and another telling him to stop? Like it, that, that could be a, a bit conflicting. But given how fast the car was going, it's like that – it just didn't seem – it, like we saw the video and it kind of refuted what the police officer says happened. Yeah. Um, yeah. When you say how fast the car was going, the, it, you're saying it, it wasn't much. You know. Yeah, exactly. Extremely, you know, slow. And it was a raining night and it's, you know, maybe a lot of miscommunication. Yeah. It was, I, I, I don't think honestly that anything's going to come of this. It was just, one of the more shocking stories that we've had recently. Yeah, and a, a very yeah, it, and it was yeah, and I'm I'm not a big golf guy. I know you like golf more than me. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I I mean, like I just don't I I don't find it very exciting to watch. But I thought this was just a pretty crazy story. Mm -hmm. um, imagine, well, imagine if that happened in if like uh, in a, in the Super Bowl, if yeah. a quarterback, like imagine if a quarterback. If a starting quarterback, one of the Super Bowl team get Super Bowl teams gets arrested, right? Exactly. That's yeah. <laughs> That's pretty close to an equivalent for a team sport. Yeah. Yeah, I mean that, that's that's certainly worse than a Super Bowl winning quarterback's father getting arrested. Uh, yeah, yeah, <laughs> which we did have. Yeah. Yeah, it seems like I agree with you. I, I think it seems like nothing's going to come out of this because it doesn't seem like. The police, the police officer in this case was being very honest about what happened, and mm. I, apparently the charges are going to be dropped. I don't know, uh, but it, it looks it looks like 
the charge is going to be dropped. But also, it's like me thinking it's like at some point this cop had to have figured out that this was a fame, that this was a golfer, a professional golfer lying about something like that. And knowing that the that video probably will come out like it, it it's, it's got to be like a really that's one of the dumbest things you can do, like lying about something like that when with like a high profile person. I don't know how soon he figured out that he was a high profile person. I don't know. Honestly, I don't know how soon I would have noticed it was Scotty Scheffler. Uh, but at some point in the interaction, <laughs> he would have had to have noticed. Um, I, I don't know. It's just it, it, it to me, it just strikes me as very dumb from, from the police officer, uh, from, like the police officer. Yeah, I agree. Um uh, so can can we uh, talk? So we we talked about your Rangers a little bit last week. Uh, they they beat the Hurricanes. They won game. Uh, they're up. Uh, they're down one nothing against uh, the Panthers. Yeah. Uh, you, you were more. It, it, I think that Ranger fans panicked a little bit in this series. People were freak. People were freaking out because it felt like they could blow a three zero lead. Uh, it, it, it was a very it, it was unlike the Knicks, where the Nick fan, where Nick fans were basically saying the Knicks are playing with house money, and there's uh, uh, and you know we have a bad injury situation and blah blah blah, and you know we're kind of okay if we if we lose. If the Rangers had lost, being up three nothing, it would have been so devastating. It would have been historically bad. I think that's why Ranger fans were so like nervous about it. Um, but I, I don't. Do, do you think? I don't know how much you know about the Florida Panthers. Do you think they have a – do you have a lot of faith in the Rangers this series? No. Well, the, uh, also, you, you're forgetting also the Rangers were down 3-1 going into the third period of, of uh, game six. Yeah. And then Chris Kreider scored a hat trick to give them the win. But, um, no, I mean, the only thing that I know about the Florida Panthers is they were in the Stanley Cup final last year. Um, and they lost to Vegas. So, I, yeah, I, I don't know if I have that much of a confidence because I still think the same thing that, that I thought um, last week, which is that the Rangers' offense has not been very good recently. And um, they, uh, they again, that yeah, they had a good, they had a good for third period, but at the same time, only one guy scored all the goals. Um, and uh, last night they scored nothing against Florida. Um, two of the goals were very fluky uh, for Florida, but I still don't really have much much um, faith in them to go anywhere really past this. I just don't think that they're uh, that they're that great um, of a team. And I, I think basically the same things that I thought last week, which is just they're not uh, – Built to fully win a championship, and I think, barring that third period, that hat trick, I think they would have been in trouble against uh, Carolina for Game Seven. So um, I don't think that it uh, it's that big of a uh, of a difference, um, but just because they won a game where one guy scored in the third period and they had a good third period, right? But at the same, the thing is though, it's like. It's always better to make it past that. I mean, do you think – my question is, do you think they would have lost game seven? Yes, 100%. Okay. So the thing I always, is – I always think that the the uh, a team that blows a 3-0 lead will lose a game seven. It's just too hard to – to. Uh, I just think that all the momentum is one way. Yeah. I mean, I the, the Yankees – the Yankees are obviously the most prominent team – to lose a game right down three zero or up three zero, um, and especially bad for the Yankees because baseball is by far the hardest sport to come back from three zero. That's um, hockey's a lot easier than baseball, right? Because in baseball, your best player changes every single game, or your most important player. Yeah. Um, but uh, the the Yankees got absolutely blown out in that uh, game seven. If you re- it, it was four nothing, like before the Yankees were courting out, I think. Um, yeah. So I, I I know that the Celtics lost the game seven last year, but I still had a lot of confidence the Celtics were going to win that game. But yeah, I I think that it just builds up that pressure. Um, and I thought also like 
the Hurricanes lost two games in overtime, one of them in double overtime as part of that 3-0. So that that was that was a a three zero that could have really easily been two one to the other side, right? So it wasn't you know a three zero. Yeah, I, I think they would have lost. I mean, I don't. I just think that the team is is not built for that as they get later on into the rounds and their offense is slowed down. One guy they've scored f- four goals in two games, and two guys have scored them. So they've only two guys have scored over the last two games. Um, that's not, uh, that's, that's not terrific. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I, I totally get all that. I mean, it, it, I mean you, you, like hockey fans are always talking about how great, I mean, how great the NHL play. You ever notice like hockey fans always talk about how great the NHL playoffs are and then also yeah. feel the need to like put down the NBA playoffs. Yes. And, the, and, 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 the NBA playoffs have been way better. The le- last year they certainly were better, and this year I think they've certainly been better. Um, I mean that that the Knicks Philly series. I think that you could make an argument that that was, if not the, I think it was. It, it's in the it's in the conversation for one of the greatest playoff series of all time, in my opinion. I mean, every single game went down to the very last second. Yeah, um, and it could have gone either way. And everyone could have gone either way. And there were two insane comebacks by both teams in the last seconds. Yeah. Um, so I, I think that the, the, yeah, I think the NBA playoffs this year have been way more exciting. I mean, even though it was five games, the, uh, the Denver Lakers series was extremely exciting. That, that yeah. also came down to the last play every game, every series, every game. Yeah. Um, so I, I, I do agree with that. I think hockey fans maybe have like a little bit of like a, a like a, a superiority like complex where they like feel smaller maybe because they are than the NBA and but I, I, I also hate that like when leagues like com- fans like compete to make it seem like you yeah. can't like both. Like if you right. like hockey, if you're a big hockey fan, you have to hate the NBA yeah. and so on and so forth. They're not like rival sports or anything. Right. It, it's just a weird sort of narrative that gets uh, thrown around. Um, it, it, yeah, the NBA playoffs have been great. And, and part of the reason is that there is a lot of new blood. Uh, I, I mean, we're seeing uh, a, a lot of really great young players. It, it seems like a young, a, a really, it seems like a really young playoff this year. Like there's a lot of really great young players and uh yeah, I mean Anthony Edwards. We never like like Anthony Edwards, for instance, was not this big of a story. The Timberwolves are not a story like this last year or two years ago or anything like that. It's yeah. sort of a new thing. Um, and the the Mavericks, you know, I mean, they were always a big story, but they haven't got really quite gotten this far yet. Uh, mm-hmm. And it just seems like there's going to be a whole lot of. It, it, like I think all of that is good for the NBA and the fact that a lot of these games have been trema- have been great, many of them. Uh, I mean, th- there's been some blowouts too, but many of them have been great. Um, uh, did you did you see? Uh, so another coaching staff thing. JB Bickerstaff got fired. Cleveland fired JB Bickerstaff mm. after five seasons. Uh, I don't know how much. It, I'm not exactly sure why. I don't know if it was because it had anything to do with like star players or anything like that. I don't know if you know of that at all. Um, no, but I, I don't really understand this at all. I mean, they had a better season than they did last year. Um, they were the same seed as they were last year, but they lost to the Knicks in the first round last year in five games when they had – home court advantage. Um, they beat the Magic, who are a pretty good team, honestly. The Magic are not – like, beating the Magic is not anything to sneeze at. It's a pretty good win. And then they, lo- they lost in five to the Celtics, but Donovan Mitchell didn't play the last two games. Right. Um, so I, I, I don't really understand. I think maybe he's being scapegoated, but if you thought that, the, that Cleveland underperformed or anything, that's just incorrect. Right. They – Right, they've only been getting better. Um, it, I don't know how much of it is just like it could have been more internal. 
I, I think that sometimes in the NBA, as you said before, that the inmates run the asylum a little too much. I don't know if that I, I don't know if that's what happened here. It could also be they were like, it was, I mean, it's not like he could have won uh, an, an NBA. It's not like any head coach could have won the NBA finals with J.B. Bickerstaff. I mean, mm-hmm. with uh, with uh, with uh, Cleveland's current roster, you could have the best head coach in the world. You could have Phil Jackson, Gre- uh, Greg Popovich. It's not like <laughs> they would be able to win the NBA finals with this current roster. Right. Uh, uh, sometimes, like I said, I think a lot of times players have something to do with it and they want coaches fired. Uh, I don't know if it, if it did in this case, but that certainly is what happened with the Bucks and Adrian Griffin. Uh, the, the Milwaukee Bucks put out a video of the players dancing around Correct. after Adrian Griffin was fired. Correct. Uh, kind of a weird – I've never we've never really seen that before. Uh, so I don't know. It, that's just how the NBA is now, it seems like. Uh uh, it, I, I don't know who they're going to hire. I saw uh, another firing, and I know we didn't talk about it much. I thought it was weird was the Frank Vogel firing. They fired him after one season and still have to pay. They, they paid him a five-year deal, and they fired him after, like, one season. Like, I, I don't, I, I didn't really understand that. Yeah. I mean, you didn't? Not really, no. And you thought, I mean, I don't know, you, you thought that he, uh, I don't know, I, I just didn't think that, I, I wasn't that surprised by that, because they, I mean, that was, that was like a complete opposite, like the Suns were, the Suns were way better than they finished, I mean, or should have been way better than they finished. I, I would understand if it was like his fifth year or something, and this happened over and over again, I wouldn't fire him after one year like that. Uh, I, especially when you have to pay him anyway. Uh, I mean, to me, I think it would make more sense to at least give him another, at least one more year. Uh, I I thought fire him, firing him like that was just too, I thought they fired him too quickly. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, but I, I, I understood that much more than I understand the biggest staff one. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, look, look, I, it's not that I don't understand why it happened. It's just like. I, it's more that I don't agree with it than uh, more than anything. It's that I I would say it's that I don't agree with it. Uh, yeah. Uh, so uh, so some football stuff. Aaron Rodgers is apparently healthy. He apparently did everything in OTAs. Um, it, I'm really excited for this season. I'm I'm actually probably more nervous than I am excited. The Jets have like six primetime games, tied for uh, tied with the Niners and the Cowboys. In primetime games, I never thought the Knicks would be such, uh, the Jets would be such must-watch television. Throughout most of my life, they've been much turn must turn off television. Uh, and apparently, Aaron Rodgers is fully healthy. Uh, that doesn't make me any less nervous about his health in the future <laughs> because I feel like this could go badly. Well, he's fully healthy starting last year, so yeah, exactly my point. He was fully healthy starting last year. Um, but I mean, I guess that's better than him not being fully healthy now. I mean, <laughs> uh, yeah, I don't know. I don't know. And I don't know how much I trust that he's fully healthy or whether he is or isn't. I mean, I, I think it was probably smart that they didn't, you know, entertain that ridiculous idea that he was going to come back last year. No, it, um, I mean, yeah, we'll have to see. I, I think that, you know, the jets are going to, you're going to, I think that no matter what, Every game that you – every snap that the Jets take, you're going to hold your breath, I think, no matter what, right? So – Yeah. And especially when there's pressure on the quarterback, which there's still going to be a lot of – I mean, there's still going to be a lot of pressure on the quarterback, let's be honest, you know? You mean like – when you say pressure on the quarterback, you mean like rushing like pressure? physical pressure. Physical like pressure. Physical pressure. Okay, I, yes. I didn't know if it meant physical or mental pressure. Well, both, yes. really. Well, there is, but I mean, there's, but he can handle the mental part. It's That's not true. really his. It's not really his uh, as as much in his hands to hire to to uh, deal with the physical part. And so, yeah, I mean, the offensive line is they've made you know some good good signings, but it's still not you know top tier. Yeah. Um, it's tough to be much worse than it has been, but. I do also think that it's it's becoming harder and harder in the NFL to have a good offensive line. I think that has a lot to do with 
I mean, I think that also just has a lot to do with how good defensive linemen have been and pass rushers have become. But I, you know, I, I think you're going to hold your breath every time that um, the ball gets snapped, no matter yeah. what. Yeah, I think you make, I think that's true. Uh, there's, I think that, like we often, I've said this before, but it's like, it seems like every team has a bad offensive line. We keep hearing about bad offensive lines and it's always, it's often used as an excuse for a quarterback's poor play. But then like you realize, and you're like, it seems like everybody has a bad offensive line. Uh, And I mean, the thing is with the Jets, it's like they need a good offensive line more than any other team or more than most other teams in the league. Uh, mainly because they have a very uh, fragile and valuable quarterback. It is like, it, it, like Aaron Rodgers is like, a, is like an old, is like an antique piece of glass or something that is like very valuable and also very breakable. Like that's basically where Aaron Rodgers is behind center. So it's, it's uniquely important, important for the Jets to be able to protect him. And obviously 40 year old quarterbacks are more injury prone. Another thing is that, Last year, there were a lot of quarterback injuries. I think 66 quarterbacks have started. That's more than two per team, or really about two per team on average. So, you know, Nick, Jet fans, are we're all going to be nervous throughout the season because we don't know what's going to happen with Rodgers. And it's not just that. It's also just, you know, some BS distractions that go on off the field all the time with him. But, uh, But, like, the thing is, though, another thing is that I think that for me, now I can't speak for every Jet fan. For me, I was at that game when he collapsed. I was at that game. And I will say, I didn't realize, and at least until I got home, that it was over. That he was out for the season. Um, it didn't look that bad in person when it happened. It, it didn't, I was not personally convinced that when he went down, that his whole season was over. I thought... He's injured. He'll be out for the rest of the game, maybe, and then he'll be back next game. That's what I thought could have been the case. I don't – after that injury, I will never view quarterbacks going down the same ever again. Uh, I I will just never see it again. Also, just so you know, you – you just so for context for the viewers, though, by the way, you're saying this, but you also – the second that he went down, you also texted me, and I have it right here – my worst nightmare. Yeah, I did. I did so. say that, but but I wasn't I wasn't sure. Like I, I like the thing is, I did say my worst nightmare. I did say that, but I wasn't sure that the season was over at that point. I thought maybe he'll be okay, um, but I, I I didn't know. And here's the other thing: is that every single season, at least multiple times. There will be a play for on a quarterback that might make it look like that will be a scare at the very least. That might make Mike that might make it look like that's like a season ending injury, yeah, at, at some point. So, Jet fans are going to be it's kind of like remember, and you know, you forget about it eventually because oh, it was nothing, but you know, this may feel like ancient history. But remember when we thought Jalen Brunson's season was over that one, that one time a couple months ago, yeah. <laughs> it's yeah. a similar type of thing. Uh, well, I mean, yeah, I mean, it was especially if you were, and you know, I think that there was a lot of trauma because if you were a Met Jet Nick fan, you had two of your best players go down with knee injuries in the, you know, span of a few months. Yeah, um, I, mean, I think Ed, Ed, Edwin Diaz sort of more, more um, of the um, more of the. Uh, one of the more unbelievable injuries that I've ever seen in my entire life. I think. Like, <laughs> yeah, it was like the most Mets thing. Injured while celebrating. That and is. I heard that I, I, I'm not a big. You're obviously a, a, a big Mets fan. I'm not a big follower, but I heard he's been horrible this year. Correct. He has been horrible. He has yeah. been horrible. The Mets have been terrible. And uh, speaking of the Mets, Steve Cohen, he deleted a tweet. Uh, you showed it to me. Basically, he responded to. Hold on, let me pull this up. He. He uh, hold on. Uh, he he responds to someone saying they want to blow up the team. Yeah, yeah. And basically, he said afterwards. Uh, yeah. He, he, wait, hold on. You, you, you have it. Uh, you sent it to me. 
Yeah, it was it was to um in response to this account called Mets News and Links. I don't know, I've never heard of them. And it said some afterthoughts on last Sunday's let's blow it up post. And then Steve Cohen responded, it tweeted, all in the future. Not much we can do until the trade deadline. So I think that I'm under the impression based on that that Steve Cohen is saying out loud what a lot of Met fans are thinking. Uh it's also not the best look when <laughs> the owner is talking about blowing everything up. That is usually a thing that fans say. Uh correct. When they've given up or or are just overly emotional, like Frank the Tank would say after one loss. Uh mm-hmm. it, it's a little different when an owner says it. Uh it tweets it no less. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I think that, yeah, and I think that Mets fans are kind of, would you would you say that Mets fans are kind of turning into where they were like, so like in love with Steve Cohen, like it was the greatest thing that ever happened. I think there's a lot of, a lot of them are turning, especially from the view that he's the greatest thing that ever happened, but almost to now where they have a negative view almost. Um... Yeah, I, I would say that's definitely true. Maybe not a negative view. I, I mean, you, you have to remember, it's like it's similar to how Jet fans felt about Mike McCagnan. Uh, after before Mike McCagnan, we had John Idzik, who is a, a, a historically bad GM. Uh, they, they were, I mean, remember those fire John Idzik guys? Uh, they they put up those billboards saying fire John Idzik, and you know John Idzik was just a really really bad GM. And when Mike McCagnan came along, Jet fans were very, we were all very excited about McCagnan because it was something different and something, and it's something better for sure. Um, But it's like, he really wasn't that good of a GM. He was okay. Uh, But it's a similar type of thing. He really fell short of expectations. It's the same thing with Steve Cohen because Steve Cohen talked a big game and we had higher expectations, but it it's not just that. It's like, look, the Mets have had really bad ownership for many years. We have – the Wilpons are very cheap and never really made moves. And Steve okay. Cohen talked the game and was talking about making moves. The problem is those moves are all 40-year-old pitchers. <laughs> like, it, they weren't – they weren't – they didn't turn out to be good moves just objectively. They were not good moves. So – obviously we're upset about that. Uh, I mean, I wouldn't say my, my personal view of Steve Cohen is negative, although I think that could change, um, you know, in a couple of years, but th- that's just generally how we feel about it. It's but like, he, he really, we really didn't live up to our expectations. I, well, I mean, he said he would have them winning the World Series in five years also, and they're already at what year five? This is year yeah, five. Right? It's not happening. And by the way, I, I can't stand when people do that. It's like, don't put up these ridiculous arbitrary timetables that you don't know how it's going to work within uh, – like don't put that kind of pressure on – don't put that – don't put that out there or put that kind of pressure on yourself. Like it's just not a smart idea. Uh, Rex Ryan did that with, when he was on the Jets. Like it – but like it, it was just – it's really stupid. There's no point yeah. in doing that. Um, it, like just – I don't know. It, it's it's dumb. It's, it's also a very uh, – apparently like he deleted it. Apparently he said it meant to be a private message. Yeah, um, I mean it's – it's it, he was lying about whatever he was said. But what is the difference yeah. though? What is he the difference though? Because he, you know, he, he was send, supposed to be a private message though. He still would have said and thought it though. Correct. Well, exactly, but the fans wouldn't have known it. That that would be the difference. That right. that would obviously be the difference. It doesn't change anything, obviously, but but I'm saying uh, from his excuse point to say, well, that was supposed to be a a right, um, right. you still think it though, right? Right, exactly. Uh, it's also uh, it is also so oddly hilarious that like. It's it's a very it's a very boomer move. Like this is a guy who's extremely wealthy, a really smart guy, and he is like just unable to figure out that like the difference between a tweet and a private message. Like it like it is just such a boomer move. Uh, <laughs> I I just I, I find kind of funny. Um, yeah, I agree. Uh, with with that tweet. 
Um, so you saw the bagel boss guy is back in the news. He uh, attacked a guy. He got into another fight with a guy in a casino. Yeah, he did. And he was, it was, it was very similar. So he was like a five. He's like, what is he like five foot? I think he's actually five foot. And, but he, a lot of times is like, you know, playing the tough guy or whatever and going at, and uh, he was attacking the guy and it literally looked like a child attacking somebody. And he was just like, he was like throwing punches at the guy's leg. It was a wild video. Yeah. He was just like throwing punches and getting kicked. Yeah. Uh, it, well, well, basically it all feels like ancient history now from when that video first went viral. When yeah, it was, he was six years ago. Five, yeah, five years ago. Um, yeah. It, in in the bait, it, like it, so now it feels like ancient history. It is first of all the odds of going viral are not really like the odds of you becoming that guy who goes viral, like the Bagel Boss guy, are very low. I would say in general, this guy did it twice. Yeah, <laughs> he, literally, he did it twice. He Bagel Boss guy twice. Maybe he does it like every five years. Like another five years from now, he's going to do it again. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. He just reappears. This was not at. As bad as what happened in the bagel boss in that bagel shop, like that, it wasn't. Right. He didn't take the L that, it, like he was like brought to the ground and everything. like the first time it looked a lot worse. Um, it's I I thought the weird thing about this fight was like what is the context of this that led to it because the bagel the, the initial video it seemed like there was a little bit of context to it right like. It seemed like it, it was sort of generally what it was about. I think the funniest part when it happened the first time was when he like threw down his bagel and then like went back to pick it up. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, but the thing is though, it's like I, I think that this guy seems to have a personality trait where like he, he seems to have just been like part of you feels bad for him because he's probably been beaten down and picked on like his whole life for being short. Like he's short, but he's not so short. He, he's not like Mickey Abbott level short. So he's in a bad like sort of situation where it's like. He's short, but not quite that short. Um, yeah, but, he's also, short, but he's not a he's not a um, little person. Yeah, correct. And uh, right, and, and, but also it's like I think that he just seems to have like a very combative personality. I think some people can learn to be like the lovable short guy, whereas he's like the total opposite. He's just like I'm gonna fight everybody. Like he's like he just seems a lot more angry and to me the thing is it is weird to me what starts fights in especially in a place like a casino <laughs> like it just seems it just seems a little weird it, like what was that over um I, i've been in casinos many times i've never gotten into a fight ever uh <laughs> it's just a weird place to fight no i don't think i've even gotten even close to in a fight in a casino but yeah i know it's insane but he obviously has very um very serious anger issues. Yeah. And very, very, he's, he's obviously very insecure about his height. Yeah. Um, so I, I think that's obviously, uh, <laughs> that obviously has to do with it. Do you know what casino that was? Um, I think I heard from someone that was live in Philadelphia. You know, it's sad when you go to casinos in Philadelphia instead of Atlantic city. <laughs> <laughs> like it, it didn't yeah. look like an Atlantic City casino because it I feel like an Atlantic City casino we'd be more familiar with. Right. Um yeah, I think it was live in Philadelphia, but uh yeah, I mean the the Bagel Boss, I think the 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 store Bagel Boss is more associated with the video than it is um with uh with anything else. Like if yeah, I think about Bagel Boss, I think about the video before I think about anything else. Yeah, no, definitely. Uh, the, the thing is, though, I, I think that it was good for Bagel Boss's business, if anything, right? Because yeah, like Bagel Boss is now associated with that. Uh, with, yeah, with, uh, I agree. With, with that viral video. It's more of a name. I didn't really know. I'm not from Long Island, so uh, thankfully. But um, <laughs> I, uh, I, um, I didn't know what Bagel Boss was until that video yeah so i yeah i think that was that was a big time help to them 
and it's it's something that is uh, associated with them. And a lot of people, especially in this area, will see it. I mean, we'll 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 see it and connect it with that. Um, yeah. When they see the name, I remember like Boomer and Geo would talk did like a whole segment on it and everything. Um, yeah, yeah, because it was during the summer and there wasn't much sports going on. Yeah, and, and they're, obviously, both, they're both Long Island guys too. So yeah, yeah, they're both Long Island guys, especially Geo because he's all the way out there. Yeah, he is. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I, I do. I, I remember that. I wonder if they're going to talk about it again. I, I bet. I bet they will talk about this new video. Yeah, I'm sure they probably have already. Uh, <laughs> live at DJs in because e, and they're they're they'll be live at DJs on uh, Friday because even guys who grew up in Long Island on Long Island know uh, that the Jersey Shore is better than Long Island. So uh, <laughs> that's yeah, I, and you're not even from New Jersey either, so you you don't really right. have a dog in this fight. Well, I, I have a dog in the fight because I'm a, I, I I love the the shore, but. I've actually, I think I've only been on Long Island once, um, but uh, yeah, I, 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 the the shore is 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 more synonymous. I would I would say that even if you, even if you're from, no matter where you're from in the New York area, the shore is more synonymous with summertime than Long Island, unless you're yeah. like really, 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 really like ritzy and 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 whatever, and you go to the Hamptons, right. Right, uh, but the shore is way more is way more um, is way more uh, with real New Yorkers than um, way more connected with summer than Long Island, definitely. Well, I'm sure a lot of Brooklyn and Staten Island people go to DJs all the time. Yeah, people uh, from Queens. I mean, even 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 Doug Heffernan used to go to the Jersey Shore. <laughs> yeah, as well, well Long Island. <laughs> uh, well. Uh, well, Boomer and Carton, they also did shows. When they were still on, they also did shows from DJs. Correct, because it's the shore is way more is way more um, uh, synonymous with summer. I mean, they wouldn't make a, a – it was – it. Jersey Shore was way more synonymous with summer even before the show came out. Right. I mean right. – um, I mean uh, – uh, like DJs was was big in like the eighties even like it, there, my my uh, parents used to hear like radio ads for it so the short was bigger even before the show came out and that just but the show just bol- bolstered it but the 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 thing that was sort of significant about the show is that the show you know seems like and I'm a fan and I'm a fan of the Jersey Shore but it seems like. You know, I think when people watch the Jersey Shore outside um, of the New York area or who haven't been to the shore, they're like, well, you know, this is so ridiculous because how do people like there's no one that would actually act like that. But that is they're just a microcosm of everyone that goes down the shore. You know, a lot lot of people that go down the shore. That's something that is is way more connected with summer. And 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 DJs in, in Belmar is obviously I would say the biggest connection, even though the funny thing is the show Jersey Shore never went to Belmore ever. That was only in Seaside Heights, right? Yeah, only in Seaside Heights. And yeah. they, they they went to Merge, which doesn't even exist anymore. And the show that in the, the MTV True Life, um, I have a summer share that inspired the show Jersey Shore. They also went to Merge, which doesn't exist anymore. Um but yeah, DJs in Belmar is would I would say is by far the most. Even though, and Mike Francesa and Michael K also do uh, well. Mike Francesa used to, but Michael K do uh, Bar A as well. Yeah, which yeah, is, I know WFAN shows have done from Bar A. I've never been to Bar A, which is a ten, a ten probably about a 10, 10 to fifteen minute walk from DJs. Yeah, yeah, I haven't gone down the shore in a while. I've gone to Atlantic City. I haven't gone down the shore much. Um, Atlantic but, City is the shore, right? But like other, other than Atlantic City, I mean, I haven't. Gone but a lot of city. people, when they say they're going down the, but a lot of people, I don't think associate Atlantic City with the Jersey Shore, though, because they don't. It's yeah. It, it, I mean, why would you? It's a, it's a casino. It's all casinos. Like you don't really. Uh, it's not the same thing as going to Belmore, even though it's on the Jersey Shore. Obviously, it's it's yeah. Uh, that's not really how. That's not why people go really. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I do want to talk about this one. Uh, 
moment. You want to uh, when Alex Bennett, the former from uh, from used to be on Barstool, mm-hmm. host host of Mean Girl Pod. She had that. Uh, she had a viral moment. <laughs> yeah. So um, she's she's talking to. Um, I guess this is the boyfriend that she has a child with, right? Um, right. And so she's like, oh, a lot of she goes, a lot of people have been asking us what the plan is if if we're getting married. And she's like, and the answer is yes. And then she starts to say something else. And then the guy just cuts her off and is like, no, that's not accurate or whatever. <laughs> and it's just it was just an and she's like, oh, yep, I forgot. I don't propose to him or whatever. <laughs> but it was just an extremely awkward moment. Uh, a very weird moment where it, it's I, I felt like it was a moment where you could tell that she probably likes him a lot more than he likes her. Yeah, it, it was one of those like really bad secondhand embarrassment moments, I would say. Yeah. Like I felt uncomfortable watching it. Uh, another I, I think that uh, I think that shows you should probably stay away from girls with podcasts like that. <laughs> the big podcasts because all of your business is just going to be it's just going to be aired out to the internet. And there, there, there was a, uh, a a post actually the day before that clip came out, um, where she was being called the uh, the biggest um, bag fumbler in history because <laughs> she lost a contract at Barstool. She divorced a guy who um, a guy who uh, his dad owned the Oklahoma City Thunder. Which if you if you use the law of uh, just the law of uh, reality and nepotism that probably means that he'll own the Oklahoma city thunder at some point. Um, and then they were like, and then she got pregnant with the guy she rebounded from the divorce with. <laughs> um, so she, it, 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 it hasn't been a good week for her. So is, does that, does that podcast that she was on not exist anymore? Or she just no, does, it does. Really? It's, it's on a different network. So she just does two different podcasts. Yeah. Yeah. And it, it's just not with barstool. Yeah, like I think this podcast that she was doing is one that she does with the boyfriend. Or I think she usually does it by her. Or I think she usually does it by herself, but she just brought him on. Um, right. Uh, yeah, I mean, yeah, that's just really uncomfortable. <laughs> it's uh, um, it, it's not exactly something you want aired out there like that. Um, no, but in all honest, but in 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 fairness, though, they did see the value of it because it's not like it was being shot live. So it got, it gets put out there and everything. That's I mean, true. but um, yeah, it was an embarrassing moment and it just, it just like made it pretty obvious that, <laughs> that she's the one that is pretty much the one that yeah. likes him more than <laughs> yeah. he likes her. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It, yeah. It seemed, yeah, it really, it really does seem like it. Um, but uh, I don't know. I, I would bet that she makes a lot of money off these podcasts. Yeah, but, but if you, I, I would bet. I think you're definitely hurt by by losing, you know, a contract with Barstool. Yeah, probably. But I it's mean, still... I don't that, but, but don't you think that I don't think that Barstool is a place that if they saw her as having a lot of value, especially to Barstool, that they would have just let her go. No, but they had to have seen something in order to sign them too. So yeah. there, there was a, there's got to be a little bit of both. That's true. Um, yeah. So, all right. So that that's it for today. Uh, we'll be back next week. Uh, this was moving the goalposts. You can follow you can follow this show at MTGPETB on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and TikTok. You can follow the MP the Bench Network on YouTube. You can follow me on Twitter at Nick Dmart Liam at Liam MTGP. Uh, and. All right, so that's moving the goalposts. We'll be back next week.